It's very common to come across supplement ads that promise that you can burn fat and build muscle without even trying. Just buy the supplement. Unfortunately, not only is the world of supplements full of false advertising and overhyped promises, but it also preys on beginners and people that don't understand that supplements will never replace hard work and consistency. So to help you make better choices with the supplements that you do buy, I wanna go over eight things that no one tells you about taking supplements. And first, I wanna start with multivitamins because I know a ton of you are on the multivitamin train. To be exact, according to a study published in the Journal of Nutrition, 33% of the US population takes a multivitamin regularly. And I know that your doctor might have told you that they help, meanwhile, I'm just the guy on YouTube, but at least consider the evidence that your multivitamin supplement might just be completely useless. Of course, it does depend on your specific situation, but everyone should know that there are multiple meta-analysis that find no evidence that taking a multivitamin supplement will increase life expectancy. On top of that, most leading multivitamin brands that you would recognize contain ingredients with very low bioavailability, such as magnesium oxide, side, which has a very poor absorption rate, meaning it won't do much. Another common issue is that the majority of these vitamin supplements are made of cheap nutrients that are already easy to get from your diet and you're just taking an extra for no reason. Not only is this useless, but over supplementation can actually be harmful because many vitamins and minerals interact and overconsumption of one can cause a deficiency in another, even if you're taking the so-called adequate intake. Also, the irony of all this is that the micronutrients that many people are actually deficient in, like vitamin D, vitamin K, and iodine, are either not present or they're present in very small amounts within multivitamins. This is because consuming too much of these can cause toxicity, and no multivitamin manufacturer wants to deal with a lawsuit. So if you're thinking about taking a multivitamin, instead of taking a shotgun approach, figure out which micronutrients you are actually deficient in, if any, and then fix those. If you take a blood test and find out that you're deficient in a certain nutrient, then you could supplement with that one nutrient. Or even better yet, find real food that you can eat to take in more of that particular nutrient. Real food is typically a better option because as far as we've come with nutrition science, we truly don't know if there are still a ton of essential nutrients within fruits, vegetables, and whole foods in general that we haven't even discovered yet. So how would any supplement company be able to put a nutrient that we haven't even discovered yet into a man-made multivitamin supplement? Well, another thing that you probably don't know about supplement research is that it's highly affected by something known as positive publication bias. This means that scientific journals have a bias towards publishing research with positive outcomes. The reason why they do this is that the studies with the positive results tend to draw more attention than studies that debunk useless supplements. Also, it's almost impossible to scientifically prove a negative result. That's why when research finds that a supplement doesn't do anything, it many times simply doesn't get published. So to put this into perspective, let's say that one supplement goes through two trials, and let's say that one trial shows that it benefits muscle growth, while the other trial finds that it actually has no effect at all. Due to positive publication bias, the study with a positive outcome is way more likely to be published, which can give a false impression that a supplement works, even though not all the evidence shows that to be true. To give a direct example, we have websites like examine.com that happen to be great resources covering hundreds of supplements backed by what looks like a large amount of scientific research. However, it's very important to keep in mind that sites like this that promote supplement research, whether they're doing it consciously or unconsciously, they most likely are affected by positive publication bias. After all, they wouldn't have much business if they basically stated that 99% of supplements suck, which they do. And many times they end up promoting supplements that don't have enough evidence and instead the research is based on animal and in vitro data. And many times the positive data coming from these sources doesn't actually translate over to humans whatsoever. Next is the idea that creatine is gonna cause hair loss. And even though there is some evidence for this theory, it's probably untrue. The theory behind it is that creatine can increase DHT and other male hormones that contribute to male pattern baldness. Don't get me wrong, there is actual research that shows that creatine might increase DHT. Specifically, there was a study that had 20 college-aged rugby players volunteer in a trial where they either received creatine or a placebo. 
The results of the study showed that testosterone levels didn't change in either group, but the group that took the creatine experienced a 56% increase in DHT and it remained 40% above baseline even 14 days later. And because of this, many people, including myself, started questioning if creatine could cause hair loss. And even though it is possible, it's also highly unlikely. This is because we have 10 randomized controlled trials that found that creatine supplementation had no effect on testosterone. That's a very important finding because testosterone, more specifically free testosterone, is a precursor of DHT. The testosterone is what actually gets converted into DHT. Without more free testosterone, you can't produce more DHT. On top of that, in the study on rugby players, even though they did see a rise in DHT, the level stayed well within the normal range. So even if creatine somehow increases DHT, it might still not cause greater hair loss than what would otherwise occur normally if male pattern baldness happens to run in your family. Another thing no one tells you is that if a supplement has a ton of ingredients, there's a good chance that it's not worth buying. And many times, the absolute best supplements consist of only one ingredient. There are, of course, some exceptions, but in general, it's better to buy products containing only one or just a few ingredients. And there are two main reasons why. The first reason is that most of the time, single ingredient supplements are simply cheaper. The second reason is that multi-ingredient supplements often contain ingredients that are not supposed to be there. For example, according to a large-scale study, 13% of multi-ingredient supplements contain dope in the form of banned athletic performance enhancing drugs. According to another study, it's as high as 15% of multi-ingredient supplements. Not only can this harm your health, but it might also cause issues if you're a natural athlete getting tested to ensure that you're not using performance enhancing drugs. On top of all that, another review concluded that 90% of all sports supplements contain trace amounts of estrogenic endocrine disruptors with 25% of them having a higher estrogenic activity than what's acceptable. So my recommendation is to stick with supplements that are proven and don't contain a ton of hidden ingredients and secret formulas. Moving back to the research side of things, similar to the positive publication bias from before, supplement research is also affected by personal bias. When you see a supplement with claims that are supposedly backed by research, you don't think that the research is funded by a supplement manufacturer or someone with a vested interest in the supplement that's being sold. But unfortunately, in the supplement world, this happens all the time, and it gives scientists the incentive to squeeze out positive results. A lot of times this bias is subtle and happens at a subconscious level. However, there are more supplement research scandals and frauds than you probably think there are. For example, it's easy to change the data in such a way that it becomes more skewed towards a favorable result. Researchers might simply remove an outlier from the data that didn't perform the way that they wanted, or they'll shift around certain statistical parameters to better fit a positive narrative. To help you really understand this, let's say you're doing research on a supplement to find out whether it benefits muscle growth or not. And the study you're looking at happens to be funded by a big supplement company with a vested interest in that supplement. In order to get a positive outcome, researchers that are being paid by this big supplement company might purposely put specific participants into the study that they believe are more prone to the placebo effect in the test group while placing the hard gainers into a control group. Remember, if you have the placebo effect, you can take a sugar pill and because you believe in the supplement, you work out harder and then you see better results. Meanwhile, the hard gainers are prone to not see the muscle growth. So this is a flawed setup that happens all the time. And if you're looking at specific research, the best way to know whether there's a conflict of interest or not is by looking at the acknowledgement section at the end of the research paper. Also, if you have 10 studies that come to the same conclusion, it's much more likely to be true than just one study that came to that one conclusion. Moving on to the next one, you've probably never been told that even though caffeine can improve energy levels, focus, and athletic performance, most of those effects are due to the placebo effect. For example, in a small study on cyclists, they were informed that in the experiment, they would each receive either a placebo, a moderate dose of caffeine, or a high dose of caffeine. However, instead of giving the participants any caffeine at all, the researchers only gave out placebos to all of them. And the results showed that when the participants thought they took a placebo, they produced on average 2.7% less power than when they believed that they took the moderate dose of caffeine. 
and they produce 4.5% less power than when they thought that they took the higher dose of caffeine. This wasn't the only study that found these kinds of results. Another study found that believing you're on caffeine improves performance more than consuming six milligrams per kilogram, which equals around five cups of coffee. Another thing that most people don't know is that supplementing with zinc can increase hunger. Keep in mind, zinc is an important micronutrient, not only for your health, but also for your body composition. For example, research indicates that a zinc deficiency causes lean body mass losses, and those losses can be quickly restored by taking in zinc. Research also indicates that being deficient in zinc can lower your metabolism and your testosterone levels. Worst of all, it's estimated that 17.3% of the world is deficient in zinc. And even though that's a pretty high percentage, the number is likely even higher for athletes because they need to replenish zinc more often since it gets lost through sweat. So zinc supplementation can really help benefit an athlete. But there's one thing that almost nobody realizes about zinc supplementation, and that's the fact that it can significantly increase your appetite. While this might not be an issue if you're bulking, it might make it harder to control your caloric intake on a diet. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't supplement with zinc if you're an athlete or you don't take in enough of it. However, once again, it might even be better if you can get enough zinc through your diet because that seems not to increase your appetite. Examples of foods that score high in zinc are shellfish, organ meats, red meats, seeds, nuts, dairy, eggs, and whole grains. Specifically shellfish like oysters, red meat, and organ meats are fantastic sources. These three options are better when compared to the plant-based zinc sources because plant-based foods often contain phytic acid, which decreases the bioavailability of zinc by around 20%. Finally, last but not least, I bet you didn't know that whey is actually not the best protein supplement for muscle growth. Even though whey is one of the world's best sources of leucine, which is the most important amino acid for muscle growth, there's really nothing extra magical about whey when compared to other protein sources in regard to muscle growth. For example, one study found that 40 grams of daily whey protein supplementation did not produce more muscle growth or anabolic signaling than simply consuming the same amount of protein in the form of milk. And you might be thinking that's because of the natural whey protein content found in milk. But milk also contains casein. And surprisingly, research shows that casein might actually be superior for muscle growth when compared to whey. This is because casein is at least decent at reducing protein breakdown rates. Meanwhile, whey isn't very effective in that regard at all. So as a result, there was a study published in the Annals of Nutrition and Metabolism that concluded that casein is better suited for gaining strength and muscle compared to whey. In either case, the difference isn't gonna be huge, but it's worth noting that that there's still confusion and unanswered questions even when it comes to a staple supplement like whey protein powder. So those are eight little known things about supplements that are really good to know. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also keep in mind, even though supplements like protein and creatine can definitely help, no supplement will replace hard work in the gym combined with a solid meal plan. At the end of the day, supplements will make up less than 5% of your results. This is actually a fact that a lot of people don't even realize. The other 95% or more of your results come from your diet and training regimen. So if you feel like you need any extra help with developing an effective workout or diet plan based on your goals, visit my website by clicking the link in the description below. We have everything from workout plans designed to build muscle to recipe books that'll help you burn fat and one-on-one -on -one coaching for those of you that need more help with your specific goals. So if you wanna skip all the trial and error and you wanna get fast streamlined results without even thinking about it, visit my website at gravitytransformation.com. See you guys soon.